forget the French phrase for that. Welcome, folks. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Seems to be working all right. Uh, my apologies for the minor technical difficulties here as we uh, get started. Um, this is a panel presentation on OpenStack and Open Daylight developer panel. Uh, my name is Phil Robb. Uh, I'm the uh, director of networking solutions for the Linux Foundation. Um, and what that means really is that I spend my day job working to help facilitate the technical community around Open Daylight, um, as well as some of the, of the uh, nonprofit activities as well. Uh, I'm going to uh, go ahead and let the, the panelists here uh, introduce themselves, and uh, then we'll, uh, we'll start with some questions. Okay, Mr. Price, you want to go ahead and start? Sure. Uh, so my name is Chris Price. I'm uh, on the Open Daylight Technical Steering Committee, uh, a committer on a couple of projects, um, and uh, a member of the OPNFV Technical Steering Committee as well, and heavily invested in getting everything working with OpenStack. I'm Kurt Beckman. I'm Brocade's EMEA CTO, and uh, I work very closely with OpenFlow, but also in uh, projects that bridge between OpenFlow and uh, Open Daylight. And uh, I care a lot about OpenStack, even though I'm a little bit distant from it. Uh, Dave Lenro from HP, uh, also uh, on the technical steering committees of Open Daylight and OPNFV, and uh, work in the ONF and uh, trying to figure out how it all fits into OpenStack. Uh, my name is Chris Wright. I work for Red Hat. I'm the chief technologist there, and I've been involved in the OpenStack community for a few years, primarily focused around Neutron, uh, and then with Open Daylight since the beginning as a board member and technical steering committee member. So I'm, I'm interested in, in talking with you about how we can work together as two, two communities. Very good. Um, and I, we'll run this panel, so uh, you know, uh, very interrupt-driven. If you have questions, feel free to, to come up to the mic uh, uh, at any point. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start off with uh, seating our, our panelists with some questions. Uh, and then, at, at, again, at some point, I'll, I'll uh, turn over and specifically solicit questions from you. But if you hear something that you, you want to kind of draw on, feel free to raise your hand, come up to the mic, and we'll, we'll continue a discussion on any topic. With that, um, Chris Price. Uh, so there are... You know, a lot of third-party plugins in Neutron. Um, what makes Open Daylight so special, quote unquote, uh, and uh, worth consideration by the OpenStack community as an SDN controller platform? Um, okay. Um, so Open Daylight is not Open Daylight is not built for Neutron. It wasn't intended to fulfill the role of this is going to plug into OpenStack as a Neutron plugin. It's built as a general-purpose SDN solution. Um, it's a platform for various types and styles of SDN types of technologies. Additionally, it plugs into Neutron. Um, so you can use it as your, as your data center Neutron plugin uh, for networking. At the same time, you can solve other problems in the network um, using the SDN capabilities of, of the Open Daylight platform. Um, what makes us unique now? Uh, we have a really thriving community. Uh, we have a lot of invested uh, people. Um, I think the architecture of Open Daylight is, is, is also very interesting. We don't have uh, essentially vendor plugins, so to speak. We have technology plugins. We have a southbound, and then we have an abstraction layer, and then we have functionality. Uh, and if a vendor wants to solve a problem, they can do so. Uh, and they're going to do so in the context of the technologies that we solve in the platform, rather than as a separate project or as a pluggable project. Um, and we accommodate uh, vendor extensions, of course, but it's, it's the architecture of Open Daylight is, is very neutral in that context. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in. Well, one thing, in, in case it wasn't abundantly clear, it's an open source SDN controller. So it's the, one of the key relationships that we have is to open source communities that, that would benefit working together. So I, many of the Neutron plugins are plugins designed around commercial proprietary solutions. Yeah, and, and are, are folks in the audience familiar with Open Daylight? It, would it help if we gave a short introduction of that, or are you mostly aware? My apologies for not asking that to begin with. Yes, no. Raise your you, hand you, if you're you, a guru. If you understand, a, <laughs> if you understand Open Daylight? OK. Um, and raise your hand if you've never heard of Open Daylight before. 
All right, so we, so we do have a couple. Um, so as, as Chris Wright said, you know, it, Open Daylight is an, is an open source SDN controller. Um, it, uh, it was formed in uh, April of last year, so April of 13. We've had two releases. Uh, we're going by the periodic table, so Hydrogen came out uh, in February of this year, and we just released Helium about a month ago. Uh, and again, our focus is a broad-based platform that can be used across the networking industry. And a very important northbound application for us is OpenStack. Um, and significant work has been done uh, to continue that integration work. Um, so and with that, I'll, I'll go to my next question uh, targeted at, uh, at Chris Wright. So your team has been active uh, in that integration effort between Open Daylight and OpenStack uh, with the OVSDB integration project uh, within Open Daylight. Can you talk a bit about what features are present today and your hopes for future development and integration between Open Daylight and Neutron in the future? Sure. So uh, while, while it is a multi-purpose SDN controller platform, our focus where uh, right, you know, Red Hat specifically and, and the members of the community, the sub-community within Open Daylight that I'm most, most a part of uh, are focused around network virtualization and really our primary use case is OpenStack. So we want to be able to connect Open Daylight to OpenStack through the uh, Neutron ML2 Open Daylight plugin, which is something that's actually shipping as part of, of OpenStack's release at this point. Um, there is a fundamental uh, difference between what's in the Juno release versus what Open Daylight, the Open Daylight plugin is capable of. So initially, with the uh, hydrogen release, we focused on basic functionality, and we had L2 support, and that was really it. And the rest of the functionality we got from using the existing uh, OVS plugin-related agents that come with Neutron. Our, our focus is network virtualization, managing edge, edge switching using Open vSwitch instances in the hypervisor, communicating to those Open vSwitch instances via OpenFlow and OVSDB. So the name of the project that we are focused on in, in Open Daylight is called OVSDB. Uh, really, it, it's broader than just the protocol communicating to the switch. Uh, it's about solving network virtualization in the context primarily of OpenStack. The Helium release added additional functionality. Not all of those features are exposed in the Juno ML2 ODL dr type driver. Um, what we added is additional features moving up the stack. So we now have L3 support. We have load balancer support, uh, security groups, beginning of firewall as a service. And that's not all exposed because we missed some of the um, uh, feature freeze points in, in the open stack release cycle. We have those changes uh, sort of pending in a s staging in an external tree waiting for, for Keela to open and, and for those, push those changes to be pushed forward. Going forward, we want to flush out that core support. So we have dis a distributed uh, L3 router and um, improve from a performance and stability perspective, just you know, continue to bang on it, the support for load balancing and security groups, and then finish up the firewall as a service and add VPN as a service. That's kind of our, our roadmap, really. We see Neutron as a tenant-facing API that, that is the functionality that we need to provide, and we've moved from the core Neutron API, which is actually L2 only, to the extensions, and we're just moving through those extensions sort of one, one at a time. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, next question, Kurt, is for you. Um, uh, you've spent a lot of time uh, in the OpenFlow standards environment. Um, for this audience, would you mind giving a brief overview of OpenFlow uh, in general so that we're sure that we have the context? Um, and then also talk about um, how the evolution of OpenFlow might impact uh, the networking industry and, and ultimately you know, infrastructure as a service environments like OpenStack? Sure, thanks. Um, so yeah, I chair one of the working groups uh, within the ONF, um, uh, which the ONF, the Open Networking Foundation, is now managing the uh, OpenFlow protocol standard. Uh, OpenFlow actually began in 2008 as a very low-level uh, control language to uh, basically control uh, hardware networking. That was the way uh, networking devices were thought of, I think, still in 2008, even though there, I think vSwitches already existed in 2008. 
Uh, and then the ONF was founded in uh, uh, early 2011. Um, that low-level protocol was based on a, a simple model of creating flow entries in a table. The controller would manage the entries in a table in the device and basically control forwarding in that way. And it was a good model that you could build into lots of devices very early and you could add value in a number of ways and there were lots of uh, demos at that time. But it, it was a little bit limited in what you could what you could do in the early version of OpenFlow. That would be 1.0 1 that actually uh, has gotten a lot of adoption in a lot of devices, including uh, vSwitches. Uh, well, even just as the ONF was founded, uh, a week prior to that, 1.1 was produced that, that introduced a lot more capabilities, multiple tables and, and other features into OpenFlow. Um, and that, that allowed for much more capability, but it's difficult to implement on hardware platforms. It's quite useful on software devices like Open vSwitch, uh, or other flexible devices, but ASIC-based devices are, have been a little bit of a challenge. And so basically there are some growing pains going on in OpenFlow that uh, to apply the richness and, and power, but also apply to a diverse number of fixed function uh, devices. So OpenFlow has been slowly trying to adopt, um, uh, the ONF has been trying, uh, ONF community has been trying to adopt OpenFlow 1.3, which has uh, been identified as a stable uh, uh, protocol version uh, for a couple of years now. And um, there have been these implementation challenges. My working group produced a spec in June that is really aimed at, at fixing that and there's been a lot of progress towards uh, adoption, that, adopting that model that will help with, um, uh, with implementation on, on uh, fixed platforms, uh, ASIC based platforms. And there's move to support this, that that spec is called Table Type Patterns, also known as TTPs, and there's a TTP project within uh, Open Daylight because it helps that the controller understands that. Now moving on to, to Phil's question about how OpenFlow will work in infrastructure as a service model, uh, I think the, the early model, and this was true, uh, identified really by Nasira, um, that hey, we can do a lot of work in the, the virtual switch um, in the hypervisor, and we don't need to get it all working on hardware first. That's great because there's a lot of existing deployed data centers that don't have OpenFlow capable hardware. So you know, here we can we can use SDN uh, by controlling our our vSwitch in this hypervisor, and we don't have to uh, you know rip and replace all the the hardware infrastructure. I think that's a, a model that works for some time, but there will be interesting uh, uh, hardware accelerations and so on. Uh, so over time, I think you know, OpenFlow 1.3 and controller intelligence will, will take the SDN that's now floating on top of a transport uh, infrastructure in hardware, and, and that SDN awareness will move down into the hardware as the, as the uh, various data centers add uh, software-defined networking capable hardware, you know, open flow capable hardware uh, in their infrastructures. And there will be various kinds of value adds that come from that. In some cases, it will be performance. In other cases, it may be visibility and debug or, or analytics, uh, et cetera. Although there's always ways you can do that in your vSwitch as well. Um, open flow is also very interesting in, in other uh, use cases of networking. So not all networking is in a data center or, or it has a hypervisor. Uh, there, although with, with NFV, which you guys have probably heard about as well, more network infrastructure is probably going to be sitting on top of a hyper hypervisor than in the past, but there will still be um, other things. There's uh, OpenFlow is moving down into optical infrastructure as well, uh, and so there will be um, OpenFlow and other southbound protocols talking to devices besides hypervisors over time, and that was a long answer. <laughs> no, but a good one. Um, Dave, Lenro, uh, so I know you've spent significant time in your career thinking about network policy and policy abstractions. Can you give your thoughts on the work being done both in OpenStack and Open Daylight regarding group-based policy and how those could or should evolve over time? Yeah, so I, I, to step back from that project in particular, there's a sort of a new approach to operating and managing networks that's in a transition from sort of pure research into you know, products and things that you can use. And because the word policy is among the most overloaded words in IT and you know, means something different to everyone else, I like to describe this class of solutions as uh, intent driven. And, and by that I mean uh, it involves telling the network what you want from it rather than the traditional approach of telling the network how to do it. 
So, you know, for someone that has an application, maybe a cloud-first application that consists of a large number of workloads that talk to each other, instead of specifying protocols and VLAN headers and bits and bytes and things at that level, what the application developer knows is these 20 workloads should talk to those 40 workloads and the things from over here shouldn't be able to get to the things over there. And what we want to do is allow people to describe what they need from the network at that level hand it off to a smart piece of software that knows how to translate that into all the low-level network protocol and media and vendor minutia that it takes to actually get it to work. And you know, we, we've heard so much about people who want to program the network. Um, the number of people that want to program the network in something like OpenFlow, which is you know, very technical and low level is infinitely smaller than the number of people that want to program the network by getting their stupid application to work properly. And we want, you know, we can enable millions of people to do what they want to do uh, by making it programmable through these, you know, really abstract interfaces. So uh, group-based policy, uh, there's a project in OpenStack uh, and there's a project in Open Daylight. Both of them are a flavor of this intent-driven networking, and you know what's exciting about them is they're going to enable people to very easily describe what they need from the network. And people who aren't network engineers or uh, you know network scientists are going to be able to use networks in the way that they want to. Um, it's going to take a while to productize this. As I said, it's it's kind of just starting to move from research into into products and. Uh, the vision is that you know everybody's going to have this easy to operate network. Uh, we're we're not there yet, and uh, I'm not going to get into the the micro details. But the work we need to do in the in the near future is to complete an implementation and and make it consumable for people. And clearly, the platform from which they want to consume this, in in large measure, is going to be OpenStack. And you know we want OpenStack tenants to be able to get their workloads to behave without having to be you know have a PhD in network stuff. And maybe also, Dave, elaborate a little bit on um, the concept of policy with uh, protecting ships in the night type of issues with networks. Um, you know, Neutron and OpenStack are interesting in that, you know, as a single northbound to a real physical set of uh, network elements, uh, that problem doesn't exist, but Open Daylight kind of has to expand beyond that to deal with Neutron and OpenStack as one of the applications that could be requiring things of the network and how that might be arbitrated. So maybe expand a little bit upon ships in the night problems and how policy is supposed to help. Yeah, so um, the state of the art in SDN controllers, uh, from what I know, is that people create applications that use something like OpenFlow to control the flow tables. And each one of these thinks that it exclusively owns the flow tables and it can do whatever it wants. And if you run two of these services, they step all over each other and nothing works. Uh, clearly, we need to get beyond that and, and do better than that. And it, it's a hard problem because down at the low level where you're setting flow rules in switches, um, there's no context about what anybody's trying to do. So there's this notion that we'd like to detect conflicts and, and do something about them. But there isn't enough information to really figure out what is and isn't a conflict, and, and what would we do about it? When you take it up to the intent space, uh, it's much easier to reason about these things. So, so for example, in a, a service chaining kind of a situation, um, you might have an initial rule that says Fred is allowed to connect to the internet. Um, and if you were to examine that down at the open flow level, you'd see a rule that says, when you see this bits in the header, send it out port three. Um, now, if you came along and inserted a firewall appliance into the service chain for Fred and said, Fred needs to go through a firewall when he goes to the internet, um, down at the flow rule level, you see another rule that says, when you see those same bits in the header, send them out a different port. Uh-oh, there's a conflict, something's wrong, what do we do? When you look at it in the intent domain, one rule says, Fred can connect to the internet, the other one says when he does, he should go out this port. There is no conflict. It's clear that the second rule that you're pushing down is intended to overwrite the first rule, and it's superseding it. And it's really easy in that kind of context to say there isn't a problem here. Everything's fine. Go ahead and push the rules, and, and the world isn't going to end. So uh, there's a lot of 
inventing and work to be done to take it from that kind of high-level concept that more context is better than less. But uh, it's clear that solving the problem down at the, the low level is, is virtually impossible. And uh, there's a lot of hope to be able to automate and uh, solve a lot of these things by making all of the things that want to access resources in the SDN controller domain go through a single interface, speak a single language, and a language that's rich in context so that we kind of have a foundation to, to try to solve this problem. Cool. Thanks, Dave. Um, this next question, I'll start off with Chris Price, but uh, I think we have multiple panelists up here that are significantly involved in OPNFV, so I'll, I'll certainly uh, make sure we open it up so that they can comment as well. Chris, I know from being at the booth that uh, um, a lot of people don't know at all what OPNFV is, uh, given how new it is. So if you wouldn't mind, could you kind of give an overview of what it is, who's in it, what the goals are, and then maybe drill down a little bit and talk specifically about your hopes there or that organization's hopes there with regard to both OpenStack and Open Daylight? Sure. So, so for those that don't know what OPNFV is, um, the, the acron acronym stands for Open Platform for Network Function Virtualization. Um, the intention is essentially to create an open platform, uh, create a virtualization platform that we can focus on use cases where we are able to ship what, what are defined as NFV type of functions. So, so deploying um, gateway functions, deploying um, you know, signaling functions, th th things which require um, traditionally what we have called five nines type of uh, stability and, and structure. Um, that terminology, I think, is maybe aging. Um, it's, it's more about availability than counting the number of nines. Uh, and availability can be solved in a number of ways. But aside from that, OPNFV essentially intends to set out to construct such a platform. So we're looking at um, taking OpenStack, um, taking Open Daylight, um, you know, KVM, Libvirt, Quimu, um, Ceph, uh, OVS, DPDK, bundling them into a package um, and essentially creating a, a pure open source virtualization platform. Um, so it's an open source community. The, the members involved, um, everyone on this panel, uh, or at least the corporate entities on this panel are all involved. Um, I don't have the list in my head of everyone who was at platinum and silver level, but I think there are around about 30 um, sponsor companies. Um, it is open source, so it's not, um, it's not a, a vendor-driven uh, activity. It's vendor-sponsored um, and operator-sponsored, so service provider-sponsored. Um, I can list some names that come off the top of my head, those that are maybe more active right now. We have, um, of course, Cisco, HP, um, Huawei, Ericsson, Intel, um, AT&T, uh, Orange, China Telecom, NTD Okomo, um, just, to, just to list a few people that are involved. And the latter is really exciting. We don't often get the operators and the service providers in these communities working with us to make sure that they get what they, what they need. So it's, it's really exciting to see where 50% of our platinums or something are, are service providers rather than equipment vendors. Exactly. Um, so in OpenFV, our method of operation is, is midstream, uh, open source. In other words, we don't want to build OpenStack. We want to use OpenStack. Um, so when we talk about we need to put things into our uh, infrastructure management suite, what we're really talking about is engaging with the OpenStack community and getting that done. Um, and similarly with Open Daylight, if we need something in the networking component, we're not going to go off and build it. We're actually going to work with the upstream community, Open Daylight, to actually get those components into their platform. And then we're going to take them in uh, and, and essentially do integration and validation. I mean, we're doing a lot of testing. There are, there are already a number of projects spinning up around the test space. Um, I think my last count, at least, was we have 14 physical labs which are going to spin up uh, and essentially run constant integration um, sponsored by, by various entities. Um, what more to say? What did I miss? No. Any okay. questions at this point? Anything that's not clear? OK. It is sponsored by the Linux, or hosted by the Linux Foundation as well. Um, good. Chris, anything to add? Uh, well, I, I think it's important to underscore our focus is working with the relevant communities. So we've 
adopted the upstream first mantra. So our goal is not to incubate code inside the OPNFE project and then someday eventually throw it over the wall at OpenStack and say, look at this awesome stuff we have. It's really to engage right upstream and be a part of this community to affect uh, change uh, the requirements coming from the operators. Yeah. And I think to, to Phil's question, uh, second part of the question, I guess, why, why is Open Daylight uh, and OpenStack important? Um, these are, to some extent, two of the key projects which are driving the industry forwards. They have a high level of engagement. There are, there, are, there are hundreds of developers working on each of those projects. Um, the reason to take Open Daylight in is because we are building an NFV platform. Um, in other words, the data center is a component of the network. It's not the network itself. Uh, and we need a platform which is easily able to extend out beyond the data center uh, and solve networking problems end to end. Um, so Open Daylight provides us with such a platform. Um, OpenStack, of course, provides us with the way to manage uh, the NFV uh, solutions. Um, no? What more to say? It's, yeah. Question. Yeah, thank you for going to the mic. Um, I don't think that's going to help. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? There we uh, go. Okay, that should work. Um, could you elaborate a bit on how much you plan to work with Etsy NFV and <laughs> specifically on their second? Uh, cycle of uh, standard development and how much you want to incorporate into your platform. Okay. And for the audience, maybe explain yeah, what Etsy So, so <laughs> Etsy, Etsy NFV, uh, the, the Etsy is a standardization organization that focused uh, a, a group on uh, NFV and they essentially resolved an architecture for how this can be solved across the industry. Uh, and it's considered a standard architecture. Uh, open platform for NFV has taken heavily from that architecture when we have looked at how to construct a solution to the problem of the, of the infrastructure layer. Um, OPNFV plans to implement, let's say, the, the IAS layer, the, the, the VNFI and the VIM components. Um, we have a lot of cross-collaboration, so a lot of people involved in OPNFV are also involved in the Etsy uh, NFV ISG. Uh, for phase two, what we hope to do is to take what we've learned from the reference platform that we've produced, feed that back into the standardization community so that there is a more of a concrete reference to the work that they're doing. Uh, phase two for Etsy NFV will be more in the Mano space uh, focused, I guess. We're not trying to build that today in open source. Um, and we Maybe. don't want to try and solve that problem in open source before the, the industry has had a chance to discuss it further. There are obviously some um, open concerns and issues around that. Um, but we will certainly continue to work very closely with, with the Etsy uh, NFV ISG group, um, as well as the ONF and IATF uh, and other relevant SDOs. So essentially, so if we can have a question. Sorry. Even when you concentrate on the VIM part, right, uh, you still have interfaces that are going up north to VNF manager. and. It's sort of, uh, you can't ignore it in your reference platform, but they're just now defining what those interfaces might look like. So how are you going to work around that? Yeah. And again, for, uh, the, for yeah. the audience, if you wouldn't mind to ex expand those acronyms, the VNF and, yeah. the, um, and, and MANO. And OK. <laughs> 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 uh, okay. Etsy 101. Um, no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm actually not going to try and do that because that's just going to take a lot of time. Uh, so, so essentially, the, the question was, from the OpenStack layer northbound, Etsy has identified that there needs to be a way for OpenStack to work with the, with the other software components that are managing the end-to-end -end network and managing the functions that are running in the network. Um, and the question was, Given that we provide a northbound interface from the OpenStack layer, the OpenStack northbound, um, how will we work with the phase two activities in, in Etsy, which essentially are going to try and describe those interfaces in some detail? My, my response is a little bit, at the moment, these are defined as reference points. They're not defined, specified as interfaces. Um, what we plan to do is, is analyze what we have as far as interfaces are and propose those reference interfaces in the context of the reference points which Etsy's defining. 
Um, and this way, what we can do is we can start to show how the transactions would work across those interfaces. Uh, we certainly don't plan to build anything above those interfaces, but as you say, the, the, the interfaces themselves, the northbounds, how you use the system, how you interact with the OpenStack system from, from a VNF perspective, uh, these, these will be validated, uh, they will be documented, and, and a reference uh, interface will be provided to, to fulfill those reference points. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Um, we've consumed uh, the majority of the time here, so I want to at least have an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Oh, really? There have to be at least at least a couple. I think we answered everything. You don't want us to define the acronyms, do you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, we got somebody back at the mic, but could you uh, could you come to the mic, please? Alex. Karthik. Um. Actually, a question is coming back to the topic of uh, GPP group-based policy and the work going on in the open daylight realm and the open stack realm. And just from an operator perspective, I'd like some perspective on what sort of tooling is there that can bridge the gap in, in the management and operations, troubleshooting, going across both, because that's been a fairly challenging aspect from an operational perspective. And if there's any best practices, tooling, that helps bridge the gap? I don't think, I think the answer is pretty much no at this point. It, it's so emergent and, and so new uh, that, uh, you know, crawl, walk, run, and, and we're still trying to crawl. Okay. I, I, I will follow that up. I mean, it's, it's, Dave was talking a little bit about how the abstract will be resolved into something more concrete. It, as much as we don't have tooling today because those resolvers aren't really complete, those resolvers will come with a set of capabilities for monitoring and, and, and fault management and, and these types of things, which, which we will then feed back up northbound into the management component. So it, nothing exists today, but as we build the resolvers, these functions should, should emerge as well. Yeah, and just trying to paddle us with things like uh, SE Linux in, in, in the case of Linux. I mean, early on, it was really painful to troubleshoot, and I think over time, some of those things built up, the tooling built up around that, and with things like GBP, it's going to be a similar kind of trend, I would think. Yeah, so I think initially, um, when it works, it'll be beautiful, and when it doesn't work, you're going to need all the same troubleshooting skills that you always needed, and maybe more to figure out what went wrong. But the potential is there to provide the troubleshooting in this sort of abstracted context um, where some of the pieces are pulled together for you so you don't have to go chasing them all around the network. And the potential to improve the troubleshooting tools is, is enormous. It just, uh, we got to get there. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, you were talking about a uh, reference platform. Uh, is there uh, anything concrete for the end user if we want to put our hands on? Or uh, I don't know if HP is providing a, a multi layer switch, for example, uh, or is it too early? And that's in context of OPNFV, OpenStack, or Open Daylight? Uh, the, the full SDN features uh, of uh, Open Daylight. Okay. Well, so because Open Daylight supports uh, multiple southbound protocols, there, uh, you know, is, is a pretty rich set of equipment that you can potentially talk to and control from the platform. Um, you know, certainly HP and every other big networking vendor has a bunch of switches, uh, some that can use OpenFlow for the control plane, and some that use other things. And and so, uh, you know, there's there's a combination of uh, equipment that's already deployed that we're trying to bring under the umbrella and things that are going to be there in the future that we're getting ready to accommodate. And, uh, and again, it's, it's pretty young right now and, and probably uh, the open flow based approach may, may have the most you know, shipping switches on the shelves today, but uh, it, it's all coming along pretty quickly. Thanks. Well, and there's, there's, it's not just OpenFlow. I mean, I, I, I chair a working group inside OpenFlow, but Open Daylight also has uh, NetConf and RestConf southbound protocols, and Brocade offers uh, a soft router that, uh, or router, since we're in Europe, uh, that um, can be controlled through Open Daylight, one of the other southbound protocols. So, and SDN um, is more than OpenFlow these days. Yeah. I think just, just to add to that, I, I've been speaking with a lot of people who are using. Uh, open daylight at the summit this week, um, and there are people telling me that they're they're running uh, netconf, people running op openflow, people running OVSDB, obviously, um, PCP. I mean, I think all of the interfaces that we provide are being exercised in one way or another by by various people in the industry. Uh, so there is a 
there is a, a rich level of adoption of these in, in the context of trying to do SDN with, with various network types and network elements. You, you mentioned reference platform or, and multi-layer switch. So one thing that is important to, to note is we do a lot of integration testing in a totally virtualized environment. So a great way to test open daylight is connect it to a synthetic virtual network. And you can create that with OVS. And there's, there's tools like Mininet that allow you to create these artif artificial uh, topologies. And then you can manage the, the OVS instances that are populating the, the, that are the forwarding elements in, the, in that topology. And do that all on your laptop and, and you know, just sort of poke at it and see how it works. Uh, you, you asked the question in the sort of the full SDN capability, which is a bit of a moving target. Uh, and coming from OpenFlow, uh, sort of a hardware-centric perspective, um, it bottoms up, and now uh, seeing that that uh, OpenStack and and Open Daylight are really working sort of middle out uh, in a way. And and then there's the OSS BSS stuff at telcos that's coming sort of top down. Um, what is, what are the full capabilities of SDN? I, I'd say are uh, they're not locked in stone. I, I like that open flow is a standard because uh, people working on hardware need to have things that are more static and stable because the hardware development times take a long time. And I like that the stuff that's more software centric is open source because that can move a lot faster and, and be a lot more flexible and they can kind of inform each other. But, but it is a bit of a moving target. Any last question? All right. Well, I wouldn't. Question. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that uh, that concludes the session. We are out of time. Um, I want to thank you very, very much for your attention and participation. Um, please uh, help me in uh, thanking the panelists <laughs> and enjoy the rest of the conference.